name is uh, Edward Willett. Um, and um, that thing behind me, which I'm going to just point out once so that you know what it is, is the cover for uh, an anthology I put together called Shapers of Worlds, which is the um, short stories by first year guests of my podcast, The World Shapers, which is up, uh, won the Aurora Award last year for best fan related work and is up again uh, this year. Um, you know, I kickstarted this successfully uh, earlier this year. And so it's got um, 18 authors. It's pretty much split uh, nine reprints, nine originals. So we've got original fiction from Shauna McGuire, Tanya Huff, uh, Shelley Adina, Ellie Modisett Jr., DJ Butler, Christopher Rocchio, John C. Wright, some guy named Edward Willett. Uh, and uh, uh, I miss, oh, Shauna McGuire. Yes, let's not forget her. And then we've got uh, reprints from uh, John Scalzi and David Brin, Joe Haldeman, uh, Julie Shaneda, Fonda Lee, uh, Dr. Charles E. Gannon, Derek Kunskin, and uh, Thorea Dyer. I hope I didn't miss anybody uh, because I can't actually read it. I was trying to read the little print on the screen. I suppose if I blew myself up, I might be able to see better. I'll blow myself up. <laughs> In any event, that's what that is. So uh, that's not what this is about, but I did just want to uh, point that out to you. Um, okay, so the seven scented short story is something that was uh, created by uh, James Van Pelt, who is actually with us at this moment. Uh, I discovered it on his blog several years ago now. James was, uh, was I think he's retired now. Are you retired now, James? Um, he's a high school teacher and uh, English teacher. And he had created it as a, uh, you can correct me if I say anything wrong here. <laughs> he had created it as a, uh, a plotting exercise for his students in, in his high school class. And I looked at it and I did it just for fun. Uh, well, that's kind of cool. And I've used it many times since. Um, I did it with young people as well. at something called uh, uh, Creating in the Quipel, which was a workshop that, uh, a creative writing workshop that ran for a few years in the Quipel Valley at a, at a resort not far from here. And um, it, worked, it always goes over well with kids, but it goes over well with uh, grownups too. And the last time I did it, I've done it at When Words Collide at least twice, maybe three times. And the last time I did it was, I just finished a term as a writer in residence at the Saskatoon Public Library. Uh, although for the last two and a half months of that, I was writer in residence in my own residence <laughs> for the Saskatoon Public Library, doing it all remotely. And I did it up there before everything closed down I, and uh, had a writing group out and it went over very well there as well. So uh, it's, it's quite straightforward. And at the end of it, you will have a complete um, short story. Um, not a lot of, oh, I just blew it. Yeah, I did just send me a show up. Big, okay. Not a lot of, um, what would you say? Uh, not a lot of detail. Um, I find myself when I'm doing it, I tend to cram in as much as I can by using really long sentences with lots of semicolons and dashes and stuff like that. So uh, that's kind of what I usually do, um, but it's up to you. So we will get started. Uh, it's very straightforward. Um, I will type the instructions in the chat uh, so you'll, you, can, you can reference to them. So as I say what it is. So the, uh, the first, and I'll also give you an example of one that I've done before. Um, as we're doing this, actually the one I did for the Saskatoon Public Library, which is of course science fiction. So you can see how it works when I've done it. So here's the first one. The first sentence is, yes, no pressure when people are watching you type and you're a writer, introduce what the main character wants and the first action he, she takes to accomplish that goal. You couldn't actually see me typing, so I was correcting as I went. Uh, my example from the one I did for the, uh, the story ended up being called Let's Grab Lunch. And the first sentence was, Tyler exploded from the hatch of the spaceship, arms outstretched, maneuvering pack blazing, knowing that the Kavelic drone was only seconds behind him, knowing if he did not accelerate clear of the slowly swelling entanglement field the Kavelic had snared the SS Marty Bone in, he would end up as lunch, and not a quick lunch either, but one of the long drawn out extremely painful to the main course lunches for which the Kavelic queen was well known. That is one sentence, I assure you. Um, so that's the kind of thing you can do. And other than that, that's, I will now give you time to write that first sentence. So introduce what the main character wants and the first action he or she takes to accomplish that goal. 
Uh, if we have time at the end, if anybody wants to read theirs after this is all done and we have time, uh, you'll, you're welcome to do that. And maybe I will, uh, can I write as we go here and do another one? Maybe I can. I usually give two or three minutes here. Let's see. Hello, Edward. We just had six people join us in the last 20 seconds. They don't have any idea what's going on. <laughs> okay. I will reiterate rather than write. After all, I've already done it before. So um, this is the seven sentence short story. It's a uh, writing exercise that produces a, a complete, it's really a plotting exercise, I guess, that produces a complete uh, short, short story in seven sentences. Uh, and that's all there is to it. I just uh, typed the introduction in. Um, chat for the first sentence, introduce what the main character wants and the first action he or she takes to accomplish that goal. And that's what everybody is doing right now is presumably typing or writing or handwriting on with quill and parchment, depending on their personal preference. I'm just going to butt in for a second. If you don't know how to turn on the chat, just move your mouse around. You'll notice buttons at the very bottom. Chat is the one to the left of share screen. Anybody who came in new, you can't see any, uh, any of the chat beforehand. So I put sentence number one in just a second ago. Sorry to interrupt. Typing one, two here. Okay. I wrote one, so I'm assuming everybody else has written one as well. <laughs> oh, something seems. Uh, Someone asked if uh, you can apply this uh, these, this exercise to building a full manuscript. Certainly by the time you're done, you could have a hint of an idea for a, um, a much longer story. You, anything I've written could potentially have been expanded into a more complete story. Yes, absolutely. All right, uh, this is the second one. Um, second sentence is, the results of the action the character takes in sentence number one has to make the situation worse. The character should be further from the goal now. And let me make sure that goes to everyone. So the results of the action the character takes in sentence number one has to make the situation worse. The character should be further from the goal now. Uh, what I wrote in the one I started there, uh, he had forgotten one important fact. The Kavelic entanglement field literally ate rocket exhaust, and the blast from his maneuvering pack provided it with just enough additional energy to expand suddenly some 20 meters in every direction, bringing him to a sudden halt relative to the Marley bone like a dinosaur caught in the Labray tar pits. So in my case, uh, his first attempt, he's trying to escape, and but his rocket uh, pack literally makes things worse and he gets um, stuck. So that was my second sentence. Now write yours. 
and I will do the same. And yes, if you have any questions as we go along, just put them in the chat. I'm keeping an eye on that. How are we doing? Everybody write a second sentence? Alrighty. Sentence number three. Based on the new situation, the character takes a second action to accomplish the goal. You may begin to see a pattern here. Based on the new situation, the character takes a second action to accomplish the goal. In my story, Tyler swore, slapped the quick release buckle on the front of his spacesuit to free himself from the maneuvering unit, and instead of trying to escape the entanglement field, swam through it as though he were swimming through treacle back toward the Marley bone. If he couldn't escape the ship, he would have to somehow disable the bone. And he had a half crazy, more than half crazy notion how to do it. So he takes his action is basically going back to the ship. I'll go back to the one I'm writing.
a uh, question of whether there should be any dialogue in this. Um, of course, there could be dialogue in this. It's entirely up to you what sentences you want to use or how you want to work. You can put anything in it that you want. There are no rules except seven sentences. Sort of like haiku, only that's not seven sentences, but you know what I mean. Or some sort of other poetic form, like a sonnet. To don poetic glory like a bonnet, my friend, I think that you should write a sonnet, was an actual rhyming couplet I used in a sonnet I wrote once. So. <laughs> All right, sentence number four. The result, now at this rate, we should definitely have time for people to read theirs if they wish. The result of the second action the character takes from sentence number three, is to make number three, not number E, is to make the situation worse. The character should be even further from the goal now. So Things are getting worse for our hero, 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 <laughs> hero to zero. Uh, my fourth sentence in the very exciting story of the man trying to escape being lunch, his plan, he had a plan, his plan was to catch the drone in the airlock, hoping the heavy metal door would crush it. But though he had freed himself from the maneuvering unit, he had not deactivated it, and he belatedly realized its exhaust would fry him if he tried to reach the airlock controls. And now here came the drone, the sleek black bullet head of the semi-living robot emerging into space, even as he once again came to a stop. Bum, bum, bum. So a fourth action, the result of the second action the character takes, fourth sentence, from sentence number three is to make the situation worse, the character should be even further from the goal now. I suppose I could have typed my sentences into the uh, <laughs> into the chat, but I'll do it. Read this at the end. Um, someone asked if you'd use these seven sentences in a query. I, I don't think that would work because uh, <laughs> it's going to be a complete story. Uh, but of course, if you use it as an outline for a story, uh, it would give you a place to start with a synopsis of the story for sure. Um, Catherine notes that every time somebody's joins, they have no access to the previous chat. So I think that's why Catherine has been reposting the, uh, the sentences um, periodically there as well. Alrighty. Sentence number five. Just flying along here. You may be able to guess, based on the new situation, character takes a third and final action to accomplish the goal. This should just be the action, not the consequence of the action. And that comes up next. So based on the new situation, the character takes a third and final, oops, final action is the word missing there.
to accomplish the goal. And mine was, and the one I've been reading, this is one of my uh, long ones. <laughs> it's all one sentence though. Only one option remained to him, colon, the emergency waste expulsion system, which would vent all of the suit's collected waste and its remaining water supply through a valve on his chest, intended to be connected to a pipe inside the Marley bone, not simply released into space, but as the drone turned toward him, he twisted it open and a blast of liquid turning instantly to ice hit the thing in the face, blinding it, dash, and thank the blessed Newton's third law, sending Tyler backward, slowed by the entanglement field, but not stopped completely, just out of range of the drone's mindlessly reaching tentacles, one of which whipped by mere centimeters from his faceplate. I may have cheated a little and put some of the consequences in there as well as the action. But that was his third and final action. Now let's see, what am I going to do with this one that I'm writing? Okay. When I'm typing, I'm not looking at the screen. So if you text anything and I don't see. <clears throat> yes, I do. I do. Uh, as I said, I make use of extremely creative punctuation trying to make my sentences as long as possible <laughs> whenever I do this. Um, but that's just me. Alrighty, we are up to number six of the seven sentence short story. Sentence number six. I was kind of hoping my cat would come jump on my lap because it's not a Zoom meeting unless a cat shows up, but oh well. Uh, number six. By the way, the cat's name is Shadowpaw. And if you look behind me, on, I'm pointing at it as if you can see that. Look behind me, you see the little cat's head silhouette down there? The name of my publishing company is Shadow Paw Press because it's named after him. So that's my logo. And if I move out of the way, mm. nope, I can't do it. He won't show up anyway. Uh, he's also on the spine, but that's why it's called Shadow Paw Press. There you go. James Van Pelt says it's turning into an outline of the story he's working on now. So, <laughs> okay, uh, six. Based on the new situation, the character takes a third and... No, I just said that, didn't I? Sorry. That was the fifth sentence. The sixth sentence is, the third action either accomplishes the character's goal, fails to accomplish the goal, or there is an unusual but oddly satisfying... <laughs> different result of the last action. I always loved that. 
unusual but oddly satisfying. Slimy but delicious, like from The Lion King. The third action either accomplishes the character's goal, fails to accomplish the goal, or there is an unusual but oddly satisfying different result. So this was actually my shortest sentence and the one I've been reading. He had no idea the second drone was there until its tentacles reaching around the curve of the hull snagged him and pulled him screaming into its collection pouch where he joined the rest of the crew in helpless paralyzed terror. So in that case, he totally failed to accomplish his goal. And you may guess that the seventh one wraps everything up, but at this point, this is the results of the third action. Oh, I don't think I get a happy ending on the one I'm writing. But it will be oddly satisfying. <laughs> when I'm doing this live, I can look at people and see if they're writing, but I can only see a few actual faces. So I don't actually know what's going on behind some of those screens, especially Hal, who's looking at me here. Uh, Good morning, Dave. All right. This brings us to sentence number seven. And then, yeah, we'll have time if people, anybody wants to read theirs, uh, we can make that happen. Um, I'll certainly read mine, so don't be shy. This is the denouement, which I like saying, the denouement. The denouement. This sentence wraps up the story. It could tell the reader how the character felt about the results or provide a moral or tell how the character's life continued on. <laughs> so this is how the one I've been reading finishes. Another long sentence. And though his turn as the Cavalic Queen's lunch was every bit as horrifying and painful as he had imagined, he discovered, as it came to its gruesome conclusion, that it was not the end, colon, that a small portion of the thing that had been Tyler was now a part of the Queen's hive mind. And that small portion discovered that, in fact, chowing down on screaming human spacefarers was immensely satisfying and delicious. And as the years went by and the lunches piled up, that tiny bit of Tyler reflected from time to time that when you came right down to it, there were two sides to everything and your opinion of any particular issue was really just a matter of perspective. <laughs> so that was the end of Let's Do Lunch. All right, so, oh, I haven't typed this one, have I? Yes, yes, I know, I see, sorry. Uh, got ahead of myself. I was so excited to read that closing sentence because I love that. That's just the kind of sense of humor I have. Okay, the denouement. This sentence wraps up the story. It could tell the reader how the character felt about the results or provide a moral or tell how the character's life continued on. Okay, there you go. Time to denouement. Just iced tea.
Okay. I finished mine. All righty. Um, so, Catherine, how can we let people read theirs if they wish to? All right. Um, if you want, you can choose somebody who puts their hand up. Let's um, bring everybody back to gallery view. And then you can select someone. They can unmute themselves and read. All right. Well, I'm going to read mine first. So, so there. <laughs> um, maybe it'd be easiest if I just print it right quick because my printer's right here beside me. Because you should always be willing to do these things yourself. This is, oops, oh, that doesn't work. Isn't that cool? Look at that. <laughs> okay, well, um, I was going to show you that I filled most of a page with it because I do write long sentences. But this is what I came up with while you were writing yours. Um, Anderson flung himself from the edge of the battlements without a second thought, confident that his personal anti-gravity belt would prevent him from dashing his brains against the sharp black rocks at the bottom of the wall, and knowing this was the only way he could hope to escape the swelling mass of the quantum beast emerging through the gaping portal of the failed interstellar transport gate. It would have worked, too, had he not been a split second too late. This is sentence two. The quantum beast thrust out one transdimensional tentacle and altered the laws of physics in the bubble of reality containing Anderson, so that his anti-gravity belt no longer functioned as an anti-gravity belt, but as a gravity enhancement device, effectively quadrupling his weight. Third sentence. As Anderson accelerated towards certain death, he frantically slapped at the quick release of the anti-gravity belt, hoping he had judged the new physical laws correctly. And sure enough, without the, with the now pro-gravity belt pulling at him, rather than plunge, he bobbed upward again like a soap bubble, the wind blowing him in the direction he wanted to go, away from the still swelling quantum beast, lined with impossible to name colors and beginning to make a sound that made his bones itch. Fourth sentence. He should have foreseen it. The wind, though it had been blowing a gale all day in the direction he wanted to go, now reversed as the quantum beast's maw gaped wide and it began to draw all of local reality into itself. Fifth sentence. Still feather light, he was sucked back toward the beast, the knot of this reality colors threatening his sight and his sanity. But having failed to escape, this was his only possible path to salvation. He pointed his head downward and flailing his arms like a pigeon, flew down, why a pigeon? I don't know. Flew down toward the bright white line of the interstellar transport gate and the glowing red button of the emergency cutoff system beside it. Sixth sentence. He reached it, but the bubble of alternative realities surrounding him surrounded it too, so that when he slammed his fist against the red cutoff button, rather than disabling the malfunctioning gate, it caused it to switch to emergency overload power, which in its failed state was catastrophic. Final sentence. The space-time rift within the gate burst from its containment, opening wide and wider, running with superluminal speed straight up and straight down from its origin, splitting the universe apart like a tear in a piece of rotten cloth. And as reality unraveled around him, Anderson had a sudden sense of deja vu, colon, for the quantum beast was his own consciousness fighting against time's arrow to return from the devastated future, if that term had any meaning any longer, and the attack had been his own effort to warn himself about what was about to happen, and once again, as it had an infinitude of times before, and would an infinitude of times to come, it had failed. <laughs> that was my seven sentences. Okay. <laughs> I've done this a lot. All right, so anybody like to read theirs? Uh, everyone who wants to read, find a piston button. Use the blue hand. So if you open up the participant button, you'll see that there's some buttons down below, and under the more, there's a blue hand, or you can click right. on any of those buttons, or people can just come on with their video and physically raise their hands. Uh, I see the blue, I see one blue hand, so we'll start with that one. Uh, that's Wolf Moon. Okay, uh, so this one is called The Will of the Wisp, and it begins, Misty saw the will-o'-wisp hovering in the middle of the mist-swept meadow, wondering if she could catch it, this time by offering it her little sister. Go on, Misty said to her little sister, and see if it will come to you. But her little sister screamed, You can't make me do this! And the will-o'-wisp fled to the end of the field. 
You're going to do this, Misty said to her little sister, dragging her kicking and screaming into the fog. We need its power, and you're the only one that is innocent enough to attract it. Misty's little sister bit her hand. And as Misty released her little sister, she ducked and ran back saying, I'll never let that thing possess me. Tears streamed down Misty's face as she stepped over the carcass of a deer and approached the flickering wisp and said, please, please, please don't flee from me. For if you grant me my wish, I will give myself to thee. The tendril spun from the wisp and whispered in Misty's ears, You are not pure, but your need is great, so your life is required to sustain that which you seek. Misty dropped to her knees, opening her soul to exchange for her mother's, but the wisp whispered, I never said I would save your loved one, only that which you seek, which is me. And so I thank you for your body, which shall feed my foxfire. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, next one, I have a hand up here from Deborah. Uh, all right. Can you hear? <laughs> yep. Mine's not going to be as good as that one. <laughs> um, in front of the intake desk, the animal shelter staff member handed Sally the leash of the Rottweiler she'd be walking tonight. Excited for the walk, the Rottweiler immediately lunged for the door behind, uh, before it closed behind the last person to enter, tearing the leash from Sally's unprepared grasp. Sally's dive to catch the dog before it made good its escape was both instinctive and memorable. Rather the, than the intended fistful of leash, however, Sally's efforts garnered her a face full of glass door. Wiping the blood from her eyes with her wrist, Sally frantically shouldered the door handle to launch herself outside in hopes of catching the Rottweiler. Not two steps away from the door, Sally flew over the back of the now stopped and squatting escapee. Sally picked up the end of the leash lying next to her face and slowly rose to her feet to patiently wait for her charge to finish his bathroom break. All right. That was good. I'm just looking at it. Are anybody else putting up their hand here? In the chat, it looks like there's a screenshot. There is a screenshot. I believe that's Bianca. Bianca, did you want to read it? Screen show, screenshot is just a, a thing about dialogue. That's what I'm seeing. I don't know what that is. That's not it. We do have Jim. Hey, Jim. All right. Hi, I, um, I've been madly typing here trying to eliminate all the spelling errors. <laughs> Nobody, that, uh, read it out loud. Nobody's going to see it anyway. <laughs> so, uh, well, the problem is some of it doesn't make sense, but the uh, we'll give it a shot here. All right, Tony ended, t Tony wanted to be rich, so robbing a bank seemed to be a viable option. After all, they had the money. The first national bank seemed like a logical target, so he pulled on his face mask, drew his pistol, stormed to the bank, yelled, reach for the sky, and straight into two guards with their pistols drawn, loading a small cart with bags of cash. The guards fired their pistols, creating a hail of lead that impacted and splintered on the limestone walls of the first national, wounding Tony in multiple spots across his body. With blood oozing from his body, Tony hit the floor and rolled towards the main door, robbing the bank now forgotten and escaped the only option. After rolling through the now shattered front plate glass doors, he noticed an armored car with a single guard. He wondered how he had missed this on his way into the bank, Tony, who Tony screamed at, hands in the air or you die. The guard raised his hands as a bleeding Tony shoved him in the cab of the armored truck while behind him, the guards, guns drawn, raced from the bank's doors, looking for Tony, but also loading money bags into the back of the car. Bill, let's get out of here. Tony smiled and aimed his pistol at the guard, 
behind the armored truck steering wheel, knowing getting rich was not going to be as hard as Tony thought. Drive, buddy. And that's the end. Good. I always forget that you can write things other than science fiction fantasies. So. <laughs> Well, I'm a, I'm a science fiction uh, writer, but, you know, after I heard your sentences, I, I didn't think I could compete. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, 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 I'd blather. Um, does anybody else would like to kick in? Still got a few minutes. You can use the react button, the blue hand button, any of the other buttons, or wave if your video is on. Although I can only see half of the people because there's two, th two screens. Yeah, sorry, my screen sees everybody. <laughs> Nobody going once. There we go. James wants to read. Well, that seems fair. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Thanks so much for uh, going up. So. The story that I've been working on is a uh, kind of a magical time travel story, and this is outlining it without somehow ever mentioning that it's a time travel story. <laughs> what Emil wanted more than anything else was to break away from the direction his life was going, towards being out of shape, shapeless even, and invisible and irrelevant. So he decided to fix up an old bike he'd found and use it to exercise with. And now that the bike gleamed under him like a shiny steed, he pedaled on to the 19 mile long trail through the woods towards McKinley, a thousand feet higher than Fairview. I write long sentences too. <laughs> Within a couple miles though, and despite his initial hope and enthusiasm, the single geared bike and his poor physical condition began to work against him. He stared hopelessly up the tree lined trail toward his destination, now 17 miles away. Emo leaned the bike against a tree, gently stretched his back and hamstrings, flexed his hands that tingled from holding his weight, and thought about his boss in the pharmacy who mocked him for working there 20 years without a promotion. And he thought about his disgust while looking in the mirror. So, refreshed, he sat on the bike again and pushed himself forward. By mile 16 and after several more stretching sessions, he worried he was having a heart attack or stroke he pushed his hands into his chest as if doing CPR on himself, and he blinked away the black dots that swam behind his eyes, and he would have called for an ambulance, but there was no cell reception. Drunkenly, he looked down the trail he'd been climbing for several hours, but even though it would be downhill, if he truly was on only a couple miles from McKinley, he could walk there faster than riding to Fairview. So he took a deep breath and pedaled forward, feeling his calves on the edge of cramping and his back only a twitch away from seizing as tight as coiled springs. Every turn revealed the woods, and every hill crest led to another hill rising in front of him, so much so that Emil sobbed in the bike, delirious and convinced that he'd collapse on the trail, never to be found, when he rounded a corner and saw not more forest, but the glimmer of sun reflecting off the windows of McKinley Shopping Center. He had arrived. There was a colon, by the way, that gave me that he had arrived. <laughs> he walked his bike toward the McKinley Pharmacy, not noticing at first that the cars were all single passenger and silent or that the streets were unnaturally clear. And even when he went into the pharmacy, which had no shelves with products, only a self-diagnosis machine like a blood pressure monitor, except fancier. And he might not even have noticed that difference until the pharmacist came out with a prescription. You're not in the system, he said, but this will clear up a lot of your problems. When was the last time you saw your doctor? <laughs> well, the time travel certainly implied, so. Yeah. <laughs> so is that something, is that a, a novel you're working on or? No, it's a short story. It's a, um, seven sentences is not enough beats to do the whole story. That gets me to the halfway point in the story. And for anybody who joined a little later on, James here is the creator of the seven sentence short story as a writing exercise for his, uh, how many years did you use it? Uh, oh shoot. It's, 15 or 20 years old it's i've used it for a long time um i'd used it before i think that uh you talked about wanting to use it um I, i've had a lot of success with it in writers workshop same thing same experience you've had i think that uh, people come into these workshops thinking you know i don't have the tools i or i'm only learning little teeny pieces i never get to do a whole story and they they walk out having a whole story that's that's a great deal yeah, I think that's what I've liked about it is that at the end of it, you have something you can really, you've done something, you've completed something. Is there anybody else here? I think we're coming close to the end of our time. If there's no one else, there's two questions and a request. 
Okay. Start with the request. Uh, NB would very much like to see your sentences. Mine? I would love a screenshot of what those sentences, probably the punctuation, I'm paraphrasing there, of what they actually look like. And let's see. We could have... actually paste it into chat. <laughs> Um, oh my gosh, the chat would take for it take a whole chat. Someone wants to know what approach would you use to now expand the seven sentences into a full story? That's from Kathy. Uh, well, it'd be a lot of background would have to be uh, some background would have to be built in there and the, the little characterization. I mean, the only thing you see from my character is he's this guy that's about to die. Um, if I were expanding that, that's kind of where I would start. It would have to you'd have to push it back further and set up this interstellar transport gate and and that something has gone wrong with it and the whole concept of these quantum beasts, whatever they are. But it, it's, it would be, I could see doing it probably in not a terribly long story. It could still work um, because it is really kind of a, um, a, a, not exactly a joke story, but you're looking at the punchline that the, this thing, the quantum beast is the, is the main guy. So I think it'd probably only be like a 2000 word story or, or less if mm. I were to expand it. Another question is, how could you use the seven sentence short story as a series? Uh, I'm not sure. I mean, if you develop it into a full story, anything can become a series because you can always find things to hang sequels and prequel signs. So. Right. Um, some thank yous, some thank yous. Isn't the idea to make the seven sentences work so you have to cut it down to make sure the whole story is in there? Um, I think of it as just a plotting exercise and, um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. You can do whatever you want to with it and however, it, however it benefits you and however it works for you. It's not like, I think James would agree that it's not like, uh, there's any hard and fast rules other than here's a, here's a fun exercise and whatever it sparks in you is worthwhile. I'd like to point out that Mars Seguro, my book that won the, uh, award in 2009, started as a writing exercise at the Banff Center when Robert J. Sawyer was doing writing with the style it was called and he had a science fiction course. And he came in one morning and had us write the opening sentence to a story and he said, like, go. And I wrote something about this uh, a woman with uh, purple hair swimming through the sea and it had the line in it that the water in her gills smelled of blood. And uh, that was all I had. And that turned into Mars Seguro and the sequel Terran Segura. So that one writing exercise, one sentence in that case, eventually became a hundred and, how long were those books? 200,000 words, I guess, of, of wow. fiction. Um, so these things, they're just a spark, a way to get your mind working about telling stories and, and putting words together. Wonderful. We are at time, unfortunately. Thank you so much, Edward, and, and James, good to see you here. Edward, thank you so much for taking us through the exercise. For those of you who would love to get your hands on those. I, can I mention one more thing before you wrap up? Yeah. I just wanted to point again to this, and the ebook version of this will be out in September. And if you go to shadowpawpress.com or my website, edwardwillett.com, you can find out more about it. Okay. And All right. see the cat. <laughs> yeah, see the I was going to say, if, uh, if everyone here wants to have a copy of the chat, if you don't have your chat open, find the chat button below, move your mouse around the screen, you'll see it right next to the share screen button. And you'll see three dots in the absolute bottom right of the chat screen and you will be able to save the chat there. I and did take a screenshot, so I'll be sharing that with, and the video along with uh, the screenshot. The screenshots. person who asked about seeing my sentences, I will undoubtedly, I will probably have this on my website as a, as a blog post in short order, so. <laughs> and that'll be your sent uh, the seven sentences plus your own. Yeah, magical sentences. Wrote, and I always put the, uh, I always put the, the instructions along with it whenever I post one of these. So. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Happy WWC. Thank you.